Good morning. morning. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. Man, it's good to see so many people here. Remember a year ago. If you're a visitor here with us this morning and I see a lot of new faces, I think they're all Debbie's family, but welcome. (laughs) Glad you chose to fellowship with us here this morning. Um, I'm excited. Two weeks ago, we finished 1 Timothy, and so this morning we're going to begin 2 Timothy, if you want to turn there. My job this morning is to provide an introduction for the book and look at the first couple of verses. So let's go ahead and read that together. First, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to read the first 14 verses since that's the passage I'm going to be covering over the next two weeks. 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now, has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Let's pray. Father, we come here this morning um, partly because you command us to do this to meet together and to lift your name up on high. We meet here this morning because we're family and we love each other. It's good to see everybody. We meet here this morning, Lord, to lift your name up in song and worship. And we meet here to hear from you. Not to hear somebody speak, but to hear your words. And so, Father, please do that for us. Speak your word with power through your spirit into our hearts that we wouldn't leave this place unchanged. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever wondered how Paul died? I mean, it happened in 67 AD in Rome, and we know it was by beheading. That's not what I mean. The question I'm asking is, how did it come to that? I mean, Paul was a giant of the faith. He preached the gospel from Arabia to Spain. And he not only preached it, but he planted churches and built up a whole generation of new disciples from one end of the known world to the other. He was faithful to Jesus among the Jews of the diaspora as well as as among the Gentiles. And yet it comes to this. This is how it ends for him, really? Really? at the end of an executioner's sword in a dungeon? I mean, you would think someone like Paul, at least, would deserve better than that, right? I mean, he was one of of God's favorite 
faithful servants. Had to have been. Chosen by hand. He had endured beatings and imprisonment and shipwrecks and all of it. Now, of course, that wasn't new for servants of God. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus told us that many prophets died under the old covenant at the hands of the Jews. History tells us that Amos was tortured by the priests of Bethel and was executed. Micah was slain by Joram, son of Ahab. Habakkuk was stoned to death in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was stoned by a mob of Jews in Egypt. Zechariah, son of Berechiah, was executed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. And of course, who can forget the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, who served faithfully his entire life, preaching, baptizing, preparing the way for Messiah. And how did it end for him? Beheading as a party favor by Nero. The writer of Hebrews continues the list. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 says, Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So what gives? I mean, I thought the first words of the gospel were, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And what about Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Well, we need to remember not to take Scripture out of context, right? See, it is abundantly clear throughout Scripture that many of God's favorite and God's faithful have met violent ends. Just go research the apostles. How did they die? In fact, in our own day and age, thousands of people who are faithful to Jesus Christ die every year as martyrs. Today, still happening. Now, two weeks ago, Jeff reminded us that the job of the church is to guard and defend the gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, it's just that God himself left his throne in glory and came down to earth and became a man, Jesus Christ. And he lived a perfect and righteous life. And he died as a sacrifice, a substitute for us by absorbing the wrath of a holy God on himself, a wrath that was poured out against the moral sin and filth of mankind. That's the gospel. And because he did that, he offers to us salvation, free of charge. All we have to do to become saved, all we have to do in order to become followers, by that I mean disciples of Jesus Christ, is simply to trust. You can't earn it. It's free. You can't, there's nothing you can do to merit it. And there's nothing you can do to lose it once it's yours or once you're his, because it's something that he does free. But here's the catch. When you decide to make Christ your Savior and he saves you, he becomes your Lord. He becomes our master, our shepherd. And as such, we follow him. That's the way it works. And yet, Still, today, all over the world, not just in this country, in countries all over the world where Brenda and I have served, Christians still believe, for some reason, that if they are faithful to Jesus Christ, somehow God owes them comfort and some kind of material blessing in this world. And I'm not talking about the prosperity preachers like Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen, not at all. No, I think most Christians... People sitting in this church right now, people listening online, actually still believe this to be true. People who would reject Benny Hinn's gospel hold this to be true. I mean, have you ever tried to bargain with God? I have. God, you, you, you've seen what I've been doing, right? 
Surely you can answer that prayer. Or, I'll do this, God, and I'll do that. And, and, but remember that prayer I'm going to pray here in a couple of weeks. Because, And what do we do when we're doing that? We're bargaining with God for answer to prayer based on our righteousness. When, in fact, the truth of the matter is that every single answer to prayer that has ever been given was bought with the blood of Jesus on Golgotha. It's grace. I'm not saying that God doesn't reward his people in this life and in the life to come. He does, but it's a reward. It's not, it's not a, a payment. It's by grace. God owes no man anything. You think God owes you a comfortable, secure, safe life? <laughs> you. Not Isaiah. Not John the Baptist. Not Paul. You. God owes you that safe, secure life, right? Well, apart from all the statistics and all the people that I just shared with you who died following God, who are we supposed to follow? Jesus, right? What kind of life did Jesus live during his 33 years here? Perfect. Absolutely morally perfect. Jesus never even thought a hateful or jealous thought, much less sinned in his behavior. He was perfect. And how did it turn out for him? Well, he was homeless misunderstood, hated, mocked, ridiculed, tortured, and executed in the most hideous way known to man. And you and I are called to follow him. Now, Jesus didn't stutter when he said, if anyone wants to follow me, you want to come behind me and walk in my footsteps, let him deny himself, take up his cross every day, and follow me. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. It cost him everything. And he calls you and I to the same task, to seek and to save the lost. And it comes at the same price. Everything. And you say, Matt, this is supposed to be an introduction to Timothy. You're laying it on pretty thick this morning. I'm just telling you the truth. This is the gospel. I want us to understand this is the gospel because our voices out there, the voices in media and in social media are so loud telling us something else. The gospel is not that American dream that says follow Jesus and he will bless you and your house and your job. So I was assigned to preach an introduction to the book of 2 Timothy, and this is the theme of 2 Timothy. If you want to put a title for the whole book, it is the cost of the gospel, or perhaps the cost of discipleship. See, Paul wrote this letter from prison. He's not under house arrest at this point like he was earlier when he wrote books like Philippians, when he was under house arrest in Rome. And he had some freedoms because of his citizenship as a Roman. No, now Paul's on death row, quite literally. He knows that barring a miracle, he's going to die here. He's in the infamous Mamertine prison in Rome. It wasn't a place where prisoners went because they were um, serving out a sentence. No, if you were in the Mamertine prison, you were there because you were condemned to die. It was the site of the... Um, Tullianum Pit, that's one of the world's oldest and most terrifying dungeons. 600 years before Paul, the Tullianum Hole was dug as a cistern in Rome and it held water for centuries. But by the time of Paul, it was empty. And a prison had been built on that site. And the Tullianum Pit served as a place where the condemned were held in chains, waiting to die. One historian called the Tullianum the putrid mouth of hell. When people died in the pit, often they did because of exposure, because it was cold down there, and they were in a weakened condition already. They just left the bodies there to rot. And that's probably where Paul is 
at the writing of this letter in chains. Now, of course, he dictated this letter to somebody. He wasn't writing it with his own hand. Paul says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, what we just read, he said, Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul was in such a shameful place, in such a shameful way. He says, tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. In verse 16, same chapter, verse, uh, chapter 1, he says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Paul's in chains right now. This isn't house arrest. Again, he mentions chains in chapter 2, verse 8, if you look at it. And this morning, we're going to do this a couple of times. It's, a, it's an introduction to the book, so we're going to go through the, the book looking at different themes. Um, and So just get used to turning pages, please. Look at it in your own Bible. I want you to see this. Chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. And he knows he's not going to survive this. Look at chapter 4, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I don't know about you, but that gets to me. It does. If you haven't read this book recently, 2 Timothy, man, it is an intensely personal letter written from the heart of Paul to this young man whom he loves dearly, a man he calls his son in the Lord. Paul's dying soon, and what we have here are his last words. That's significant. And he's saying to Timothy, I've finished my race. I'm passing the baton to you. This can't die with us. Carry on, son. See, Jesus came to earth. He called together a small band, a group of people around himself. He lived a godly life in front of them, taught them the good news of the kingdom, and then he passed it on to that small group. And he told them, you pass it on too, and they did. And Jesus encounters Paul on the road to Damascus, and he, and he makes Paul a new man, and he assigns the task to Paul, the task of living the gospel and passing it on to others. Now, Paul's been doing that for over 30 years, and now his time's up. He says, I've run the race. My time's up. Can't stop here. What is first and foremost on Paul's mind knowing that he's about to die? Is he battling the injustice of government policies? Is he using his last effort and his last breath to reform the injustice of his society that he, in which he lives? No. No, he has one thing on his mind, the defense and the spread of the gospel. And Timothy, his son, Paul's passing the baton onto his young wingman, and he wants him to know the ministry comes at a price. This is going to hurt Timothy. So look at me with, uh, at um, verse 1, chapter 1. He starts out, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace, getting what you don't deserve. Mercy, not getting what you do deserve. And the peace with comes with both of those treasures from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the last inspired word that Paul would ever write. And he wrote it to Timothy, my beloved child. That's not just a throwaway sentiment. Don't, don't skip over that. Paul's speaking inspired truth here. The Holy Spirit didn't waste words. And, and he says, my true child. If you remember back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he calls him my true child, my true son. Timothy was not Paul's biological son. He wasn't Paul's legally adopted son. He was much more than that. He was Paul's true son. 
He doesn't say Timothy is like a son to me. He calls him my true son. What a great truth for us gathered here this morning as family. In Christ, we share a bond that goes beyond biology, that goes beyond flesh and blood, that goes beyond this world. We've been born again into the family of God by the Spirit of God, and we share a union that nobody else on earth can even even fathom or comprehend. It goes to the very heart of the gospel itself. Jesus said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We have family in this world that goes way beyond this world into the next life. Now, Paul knows that he's leaving his son, Timothy, in a tough spot. Paul's in a tough spot. He's hurting. Read this letter this week and listen to it with the ears of compassion for a man who's in prison alone, pretty much. He feels abandoned. He feels alone. Look at verse 15 in chapter 1. He tells Timothy, you're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. Why is Timothy aware that the people in Asia have turned away from Paul? Because Timothy's in Ephesus, and Ephesus is in Asia. And all those churches that Paul planted in Asia are ashamed of him now. They're afraid that maybe what's happening to Paul could happen to them. They've turned their backs on Paul in his time of trial, and he feels it. It cuts deeply. Flip back to chapter 4, verse 9. Again, he says to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 9, do your best to come to me soon. Do you feel it? Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. Brother, I need you. For Demas, who is in love with this world, that's an agape love, look it up, that's weird, isn't it? For Demas, who is in agape with this world, has deserted me. Demas was a fellow worker with Paul. We see his name mentioned as a fellow worker of Paul in the book of Philemon and in Colossians. But by this time, Demas has decided it's too costly to follow along with Paul. And he leaves him in his time of greatest need. And so Paul's longing to see Timothy, his true son, one more time. Look at verse 13 in chapter 4. It says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left at Troas. It's cold down in that pit. People died of exposure down in that pit. Timothy, please, bring my coat. Paul's hurting, physically too. And he's lonely. Again, he says in verse 21, do your best to come to me before winter. Three times. Timothy, I need you. Paul's a man, cut him, he bleeds. Neglect him, he hurts. Insult him, he feels it. And yet, what's clear about this is that Paul hasn't let the hurt and the neglect and the abandonment disqualify him for the job that he's been assigned to do. He's in a dungeon in chains. He's been hurt by his enemies and he's been hurt by his friends. And what does he do? Well. He's still busy with the work of the gospel. He's writing scripture. (laughs) He's discipling Timothy. And he's building up churches in Ephesus and, and all around the world. Churches that have abandoned him. He's working to build them up. And I have to ask why. I mean, as a man who works, my whole life is the gospel. Whether it's here or down at school, this is my life. And I'm just used to being around Christians who find excuses not to serve. It's really easy to find excuses not to serve. Paul doesn't have an excuse not to serve. He's got good reasons not to serve. He's in dungeon, in a dungeon, in chains. He had solid reasons to keep himself out of circulation, to stop serving. But that's not Paul's life. Look at verse 1 again, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. See, we not only have family that goes beyond this world, we have a life that goes beyond this world. 
Paul, he says, I'm an apostle according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. One of the, I think one of the greatest tragedies, one of the greatest deceptions of our day in the church is this idea that this physical life is all there is. I mean, of course, the non-believer lives that way. I mean, they've been raised on evolution. It's dog eat dog, survival of the fittest. Big dog gets the bone. Of course, they believe that, but so many in the church today cling to this, cling to this very same idea. I mean, for more than a year now, all that we've heard, whether it's in conversations with each other or on TV or over the internet or on social media, everywhere we look, the message we hear is that this life is all there is. Guard it at all costs. Don't take any chances. Even breathing the wrong air could kill you. Hide in your house. Don't take any chances. You could die. But it should be obvious that if we fix our attention on death, we will never live life, and we will never do anything significant for eternity and for the Lord. Paul's in prison. He's facing imminent death. But he doesn't begin his letter there. I would have begun my letter there. Timothy, I'm about to die. Get over here. It's not where, not where Paul begins his letter. He begins his letter with life, ultimate life, abundant life, the life that is in Christ. Life that he talks about in verse 10 that we read at the beginning. Look at it again. Chapter 1, verse 10. Talking about the grace of God, he says, the grace which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus has defeated the very thing that our world fears most. Amen? And we've been united with him in a death like his so that we can reign with him in his life, in this life. This life, here, now. He has emptied death of its power. He's defeated death by rising again, and he has invited us to be united with him by faith and to live boldly the life that he's given us, proclaiming the truth of the gospel, raising up disciples, not living in fear of what this world can do to us. And to say, with him, O oh death, where is your victory, O oh death? Where is your sting? Death, I used to be afraid of you. Death, you used to keep me up at night. Where are you now? Where are you now? Oh, gone. I trust Christ. It's truth. It's true. Death brings loss. It brings grief. It brings separation. Grieving those who pass is the right thing to do. But We're not like those who don't know the truth. There, for us, there is no defeat in death. It's just separation for a time. See, you're not going to leave this world until God's good and ready to call you home. It's just true. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Paul's facing execution in Rome at the hands of Nero, but he knows that his life is hidden with Christ in God. He knows that Nero can't touch him unless God allows it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Psalm 76, verse 10. I love this verse. Psalm 76, verse 10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The wrath of man, even the wrath of man, the sinful wrath of man praises God. Just as Joseph's brother's wrath against him turned into praise for God, just as Pharaoh's wrath against Moses and against Israel turned into praise for God, just as Saul's wrath against David turned into praise for God, just as the Jews, or excuse me, Daniel's enemies' wrath turned into praise for God, just as Haman's wrath against the Jews turned into praise for God, just as the king's wrath against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego turned into praise for God, just as the Jewish ruler's wrath against Jesus himself served only to honor and glorify and praise the name of God through the gospel, Paul knows that Nero's anger and wrath 
and his insanity will serve only to honor and glorify God and spread the gospel. Paul's trust is in God, not temporary physical safety. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's Romans 8.32. It's a rhetorical question. God has given us his own son. Is there anything after that that he will, any good thing that he will withhold from us? No, it's proof that he will withhold no good thing from us, even in the moment of our death. That will be according to his time and his plan, and it will serve to praise him as we follow Christ. Now, Paul may be in prison on death row, but he's still making disciples. And so he sends this letter to Timothy in his last day, and basically what he's saying is, Timothy, I need you to step up. God's pulling me out of the fight. I need you to step up. The older apostles and disciples are all dying all over the world. Very good chance Peter was in that same prison with Paul. He died right there in that same time frame. He might have been there too. Paul knows all of those old players are getting taken out of the game. What do they say in football when the star gets hurt? What does the coach say? Next man up. Oh, we can't win now. Aaron Rodgers is out. No, next man up. Play the game. And that's what this letter is. Paul saying to Timothy, next man up. And not Timothy only. Now, even though this letter is addressed to Timothy and it's written in a very personal way to Timothy, it's very clear that this letter was written to be um, read publicly and to be shared with all the churches. At the end of the letter, in chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, grace to you, and the word you there is plural. Grace to you all. He knows this letter is going to get read there. Not only that, look at the way Paul begins the letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Okay, so he's, he's, he's writing to his son in the faith, a guy he's been to war with. I mean, this would be like me writing a letter to my son, Ben. Matt, pastor at Bethel Bible Fellowship and teacher of God's word at Messiah Valley Christian School. Ben would be, my dad's lost it. <laughs> I know all that, dad. You can, just write, you can just write the letter, okay? No, I think it's pretty clear that Paul expects this letter to be read publicly. But this is for all of us, not just for us, I mean, not just for Timothy, not just for the churches in Ephesus, but for us, for the church, for all time. I think there's a really good chance Paul knew that he was writing Scripture here. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, and all all of Timothy's Timothys there in Ephesus, and to all of us, next man up. Christianity is always just one generation away from extinction. That's true today. So who's your Timothy? Timothy. I mean, current leadership in the church for 2,000 years, current leadership always has to be concerned about the next generation of leaders. We've discussed it as elders here at Bethel. It's critical. What about you parents? Are you more concerned about your child's success in school or in activities or sports than you are concerned about their success as a disciple of Jesus Christ. They're the next generation. Look at verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Every time Paul prayed, and he was probably on a Jewish schedule of set prayers, every time he prayed, he prayed for Timothy, whether it was morning or night or noon. Night and day. As I remember your tears, he says. I wonder, is Paul remembering the last goodbye that he had with Timothy before he left for Spain and and then prison in Rome? Don't know. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I have to believe that as Paul's writing this, he's dropping a few tears as well. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. Who are these ancestors that Paul talks about? 
here in verse 3, his ancestors. It could be that he's talking about Abraham and Moses and all that. A lot of commentators say that. But I think because of the context and, and mentioning e Timothy's immediate family, there's a really good chance that Paul's talking about his own parents. Paul's saying, my faith began at home. And Timothy, if you remember your spiritual heritage, yours began at home too with your mom and your grandma. Even though Paul calls Timothy his spiritual son, Paul knows he wasn't the one who brought Timothy to faith in Jesus. That happened at home. Parents, this is your job. This is not primarily the job of the church or the pastor or the youth group or the Sunday school. This is on you. I can't even tell you how blessed I was, Carr family with the memorial for Janice the other night. I mean, all of those kids and grandkids, if you were here, you know what I'm talking about. The heritage of two people who decided to love Jesus. There are kids and grandkids that filled the whole front of the church that got up here and gave testimony to the goodness and love of God because Janice and Conant decided to love God. Is there any heritage, heritage greater than that? I don't think so. So Paul says to Timothy, that same faith that your mom had, that your grandma had, I know, I'm sure that it dwells in you. How's he so sure? Well, he's seen Timothy's faith. He's, he's served with Timothy for a decade now. I, I, don't, I don't buy the the theory that Timothy was a weak, shy, fragile disciple. I know a lot of commentators and preachers go that route. I don't, I don't see that in the text. I don't think the text warrants that view. God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, three times, God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. That doesn't necessarily mean that Joshua was weak and afraid. It, God just knew Joshua for the task ahead of him was going to need courage and strength. And I think Paul is saying the same thing. Just because Paul encourages Timothy to be strong and courageous doesn't mean that he sees Timothy as especially weak or, or timid. Now the Holy Spirit who wrote this, who had Paul write this, he knows that you and I are in the same boat as Timothy. We are all especially weak and timid at times, aren't we? I mean, life gets busy. Have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? You purposely didn't speak up about the gospel because you were ashamed of it at that moment? I've been there. Just being tired. I need that encouraging word. Be strong. Be courageous. Fan the flames. Now Paul says to his son, I'm sure of your faith. I know your faith has good roots because I knew your mom and I knew your grandma. I've seen it, Timothy. Timothy has a bold faith and, and Paul knows that he's going to need that for what's coming. So he says in verse 6, for this reason, in other words, because of your strong faith, chapter 1, verse 6, because of your strong faith, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And we're going to get into that more next week. But Paul's making it clear to Timothy here, right at the beginning of this letter, if you take this baton that I'm passing on to you, if you do what Christ has called us to do, you're headed for some rough water, son. Now, we know from church history, it's not in the Bible, but Timothy was eventually martyred in Ephesus as an old man, probably in his 80s, speaking out against idol worship in Ephesus. One day the... The pagans just had it, their fill of it, and they beat him to death with clubs. Well, apparently he lived for a couple of days after the beating, but um, why God does that, I don't know. It's his timing. Jesus himself said when he sent his disciples out on a trip, a missions trip in Matthew 10, if you do what I tell you, you're going to be hated by everyone because of me. He said the same thing in Matthew 24. He said, if you do what I'm telling you to do, they'll deliver you over to be persecuted and killed, and you'll be hated by the nations because of my name. Again, in John 15, 19, Jesus said, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own. 
Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Now, most Christians today don't have to worry about this, right? If you keep your head down and you keep your mouth shut and you keep your faith in a closet, you don't ever have to worry about this. See, this only comes to people who are willing to speak up and to proclaim the truth of the gospel. So Paul says to Timothy, lest that happen to him, and he start closeting his faith, he says, fan in the flame, verse 6, fan in the flame the gift God has given you. And the sense here is more like keep fanning into flame. It's not like Timothy's flame had gone out. It's like, keep it up, son. It's not that Timothy was lagging in his work or lagging in his zeal. It's just that Paul wants to remind him, the Holy Spirit reminding us that fires need constant fuel and constant air. Entropy is real. Things run down. That fire is going to go out if you don't stir it. So Paul says, keep on keeping on. Keep on fanning, fanning the flame. Now, I don't know what gift Paul's talking about here. I don't know what, Paul, what Timothy's gifts were. I think just from reading all the writings to Timothy, it's pretty clear he had gifts in the area of teaching and leadership and evangelism. But we're not told. And I think the Holy Spirit keeps it generic on purpose because we all have different jobs, right? Or different gifts, the same job maybe would be a better way to say it. Our job is to glorify God to lift up the name of Jesus on high, to brag on Jesus. But when you do that, it's going to cost you. He says, if you're going to speak up about Jesus, you will face opposition. That's why Paul says here in verse 7, for God gave us a spirit of power and love and self-control. He gave it. It's part of the gift. In other words, whatever gift the Holy Spirit has given to you, along with that gift came a spirit inside of you of power and love and self-control. The gift came with a, with a fire. Now it's up to us to keep fanning it. Don't let it go out. Keep feeding the flame. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Stay consistent in your fellowship with the saints. Stay in the battle. God gave you the gift, but the gift isn't going to exercise itself. You've got to do that. Fan the flame. And when you do, and when you do exercise that gift with all the passion of the fire that the Holy Spirit gives you, don't expect a pat on the back. Expect opposition. It's going to cost you. There will be opposition. And so as I said at the beginning, that is the theme of this letter, the cost of the gospel. Really, it's two themes, and they run side by side all the way throughout the entire book. Spread and defend the gospel. That's the first point. But it's going to cost you. And, they, and they're parallel. They, 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 they occur throughout the book. We're going to look at it here in a second. They occur side by side throughout the entire book in every single chapter. Defend and spread the gospel. It's costly. It'll cost you everything. So let's just walk through the letter together and look at the pattern. We're going to start in chapter 1. Please follow me along. Chapter 1, verse 8. Some of these we've already read. It's worth reading them again. Paul says, Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Defend and share the gospel. It's going to cost you. You're going to pay for it with suffering. Chapter 1, verse 11. It says, through the gospel, in verse, at the end of verse 10, through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Paul says, I was appointed to defend and share the gospel, which is why I suffer as I do. Hardship comes with ministry. Settle it in your heart right now. If you think that somehow God owes you smooth sailing just because you finally decided to follow Christ and obey him in the proclamation of the gospel, you know neither God nor history. It's not the way it works. I don't know why, but it's just the way God set it up. Let's keep moving. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, that's the gospel, Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier. 
for Christ. Teach the gospel, share in suffering as a good soldier. Just as the promised land was assured to Joshua and the Israelites in Joshua chapter 1, so faithful ministry is assured to us. If we will simply go out into the fields, they are white for harvest, you're assured of success if you'll just do it. But just as it took Joshua many battles, fighting many enemies over many years to actually take possession of the land, so it's true with us. In order to see the fruit of the gospel in our ministry, we're going to encounter hardship. And it's not going to happen all at once. It's going to take time. It's just God's way. Chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, is preached in my gospel, the preaching of the gospel, one, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound, therefore I endure everything. I endure everything from the hands of evil men, suffering, for the sake of the elect, the gospel, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ with eternal glory. It's the same thing. The ministry of the gospel at great cost to self. Chapter 2, verse 24, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So while you're teaching the gospel, you may have to endure evil people. It's okay. You can do this. He's given you the spirit of power and love and self-control for this very purpose. He knows you're going to face opposition. He's equipped you. Chapter 3, verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, that's the gospel, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, and, second part, verse 11, my persecutions and sufferings that have happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured. The ministry of the gospel, verse 10, persecutions and sufferings, verse 11. They're dual tracks, and they run throughout the entire book. Verse 12, very next verse, right here in chapter 3. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Leading a godly life means to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus means to be about the assignment that he has left for us to do when he left. What was that? To seek and to save the lost, to preach the gospel. So he says, basically, just this. Understand this, your job is to spread the gospel. It's going to cost you. Maybe everything. You will be persecuted. Chapter 4, verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Endure suffering as you spread the gospel. I'm not making this up. This isn't me pulling things out to try to fit it into my outline. No, this is the theme of the book. At least nine times, Paul couples hardship with the proclamation of the gospel. It is the theme. Ministry's hard. Stop complaining, as though it should be something different. I said that to myself, just so you know. Ministry's hard. God knows that. For whatever reason, he set it up that way. So in this book, God is calling us to active, passionate, intentional, selfless service for the king. Are you ready to study 2 Timothy? Well, I hope so. I am. Let's pray. Father, we trust that you are a good, good father. When we do what's right and suffer for it, Lord, help us to trust that you are a good, good father. And that because we are yours, you get to do with us as you please. Give us the ability to rest in that and to love those who hurt us in the midst of it. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.